How do you like that, Dad? Welcome once again to my retrospective series of A Nightmare on Elm Street. This time we investigate and discuss the controversial but fairly fascinating quote unquote gayest horror movie of all time, A Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge. Jumping off the success of the original Nightmare movie, producer Robert Shea fast-tracked a sequel with the hope of keeping New Line Cinema afloat with its own big selling franchise. As mentioned at the end of the last video, original director Wes Craven was against making a sequel, wanting the first Nightmare to end on a happy note and simply end there, and so didn't return for Freddy's Revenge, after disagreeing with the premise of the new script. Freddy actor Robert Englund almost didn't return to the series as well after being rejected a proposed pay rise. After filming for two weeks with a subpar stand-in, New Line soon realised I've made a huge mistake and promptly accepted Robert's new contract. And that's about all she wrote in terms of returning cast members. The character of Nancy returning didn't even seem to be considered throughout the process of Freddy's Revenge. Instead, we see the only time a Nightmare movie would have a male lead in Mark Patton, playing Jesse Walsh, who would move into Nancy's old house five years after the events of the original Nightmare. Freddy's Revenge was released almost exactly a year after the original in 1985 and sold almost twice as well as the first movie, proving to New Line that a franchise could be on their hands here, but Freddy's Revenge would start a controversy that to this day hasn't quite had its last breath. Nightmare 2 is essentially about Freddy Krueger using Jesse's body as a vessel to invade the real world, and Freddy invading the real world does break some of the rules set in the previous Nightmare movie, but to be fair, they only had the one movie to go off and they seemed more concerned with creating scary scenes than keeping Freddy's dream law consistent, which is understandable when you're trying to rush out a big slasher hit, but I would argue that pulling Freddy from the dreamscape and throwing him into the real world where he can just cut up a bunch of kids at a pool party plants him in the same boat as Jason or Michael. He's no longer invading your privacy, no longer sneaking into your dreams at night, He's chasing you around a pool with some butter knives, like Jason Voorhees. Doing this kills his edge, the aspect of Freddy that made him stand out, that made him scarier than Jason or Michael Myers, turning Freddy into just another slasher, aside from his attitude anyway. And that's a real shame, because despite this and Nightmare 2's weird ending, there's a lot to love here. England is back and doing a fun job, the acting for the most part is solid, and the camaraderie between the cast is really charming and funny. I think Lee, too proud to call a professional to fix the heating father character is really fun, and the homosexual subtext is great. I say subtext because it's about as subtle as Freddy's Christmas Jumper. The scenery is littered with questionable board games, phallic melting wax, S&M bars and topless sweaty men. Hell, the tagline of the movie was the man of your dreams is back, which is amazing by the way. But next comes the script. Jesse presents his situation as a repressed part of him trying to break out, a persona he can't control, a part of him that wouldn't be accepted and needs to be hidden. Freddy is clearly read as Jesse's closet gay feelings trying to be unleashed. And here are just a couple of examples of the dialogue that really reinforce this point. Something is trying to get inside my body. Yeah, and she's female and she's waiting for you in the cabana. And you want to sleep with me. 
And this is where the real drama begins. The director claimed not to notice the homoerotic underlinings of the script, despite some of the actors realising what was going on. Quickly look at this scene. I need you, Jesse. We got special work to do here, you and me. Apparently, there was a discussion if Freddy should actually put his blade finger into Jesse's mouth and back out again. So the actors were obviously aware to some extent. And Mark Patton is a gay actor, so he was nervous about the script. He had learned to be careful with showing his sexuality. This was the 80s, and the AIDS pandemic was in full swing. Being gay wasn't seen as it is today, in most situations it was labelled as a big negative. But Patton felt, despite this, he needed to take the part of Jesse. Look at how big Johnny Depp had become. This could be Mark's big break. When Freddy's Revenge released, some critics did pick up on the gay subtext. And it appears a lot of the blame was put onto Patton for how he played the character, essentially outing him in Hollywood. In retrospect today, Patton played a very iconic role, being labelled today as the first male Scream Queen. His high-pitched screams in the movie rivalled any Scream Queen at the time, and his acting was very on point, turning him into a cult character. If this was made in 2020, he might have been received as a wonderful take on the horror movie protagonist. Unfortunately, this was 1985 and Mark Patton took a huge hit from this and completely dropped off the acting radar, placing a lot of the blame on the makers of Freddy's Revenge for leaving him to take the heat. The biggest point of controversy is the writer Chaskin, avoiding blame for the subtext. In fact, it wasn't until 2010 with the release of the Never Sleep Again documentary where Chaskin actually clears up that yes, the homosexual themes of Freddy's Revenge was subtext purposely written into the movie and was supposed to reflect the fear of the AIDS pandemic and the fear of sexual discovery at the time. Mark Patton hasn't fully said his piece yet and is currently working on a documentary called Scream Queen My Nightmare on Elm Street about his experience with the sequel which will hopefully shed even more light on this wild controversy and hopefully settle it. But Mark has claimed to be proud of his part and he does think that it's in a way a beautiful movie. This hurt the movie critically, along with other aspects involving Freddy and its comparison to the original movie. But that didn't stop it from being a huge hit. Personally, I love the new Freddy makeup, opting for a lifelike approach. Effects coordinator Kevin Yeager took reference from real third degree burn victims and created this gross, shiny, melted skin effect that tightens around Freddy's facial bones really well, resulting in what is probably the meanest looking Freddy in the series. This feature continues the theme of Freddy having iconic lines, but still on the serious side. This, however, wouldn't last much longer. It's worth noting that every death in this movie is caused by Freddy slash Jesse in the real world. Not a single dream death here. In fact, dreams are only in the movie for Jesse and Freddy to talk, and not a single other character dreams of him. Freddy's Revenge has some odd visual metaphors. A reoccurring theme is heat. The home gets hotter and hotter until Freddy is finally released and the boiler room is set alight in the finale. There's also a pretty goofy scene in which a parakeet spontaneously combusts. This is a reference to the budgies that miners used to take with them into the mines. If the budgie died in the mine, the miners would know that the fumes were too dangerous to continue. And I guess Freddy's Revenge used the parakeet blowing up as a signal of danger is coming? The script is definitely inconsistent, and as I mentioned, a lot of the scenes were written for the sake of having big effect moments. Although Jesse's transformation scene is a strong effect, and I've always loved the shot of Freddy ripping his skin off to reveal his brain. Freddy's Revenge is a shaky cult classic, and as much as I love some of the effects, the subtext, and the banter between characters, there wasn't enough consideration for what Freddy represents and where exploring the dream world could have taken the script. The movie is far from perfect, but I find it to be fairly underrated and would call it an important stage in Freddy's history. New Line Cinema would obviously turn away from what they thought were problems and push themselves back on track with the third entry that would focus more on the dream world and return to female protagonists in the most fun and lovable entry in the series. Join me next time when we dive into the wild and Nightmare on Elm Street 3.
Thanks once again for watching. Obviously, this is one of the more interesting ones to research as the homosexual subtext definitely added a new level of interest to the movie, but also a new kind of level of controversy outside of it as well. So uh, everything I mentioned here isn't all that there is to the subtext. You can find quite a bit more online, and obviously more from watching the Nightmare on Elm Street Never Sleep Again documentary, there's a little bit more of it in there as well. If this does interest you, I do obviously suggest seeking it out because it is very interesting. Also the documentary I mentioned from Mark Patton, the uh, Scream Queen, My Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, as of this recording currently isn't fully released. Uh, I think he has been showing it a little bit on tour around the world, along with the movie Freddy's Revenge itself, but I will link the channel in the description. They have got a couple of trailers up there, so I definitely recommend checking those out. I contacted Mark Patton a little bit myself. He seems like a really good guy and it's 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 great that this movie's taken on a whole new relationship with horror fans. The gay community has definitely adopted it in a way and they, they do kind of champion it as an important movie in the gay community. And I would completely agree with that. It's, it's, it's certainly the best nightmare movie when it comes to just pure subtext. And there's a lot more to look into it with it than uh, a lot of the other ones as well. But next time we do get a look into Dream Warriors, which is an absolute gem when it comes to these kinds of movies. There's a lot of returning cast members, there is some inspiration from Wes Graving's script, I know they changed it quite a bit, yeah, but he was involved with the initial ideas and that, and you can definitely see a little bit of it there. But this is the movie that would definitely pull Freddy away from being, well, scary in any sense of the word. But we'll definitely touch on that in the next episode when we explore the movie and some of the comedic things Freddy would do, not just in the movie but also outside of it as well. So it's definitely a fun one so stick around and obviously once again thanks for watching.